Good afternoon. I'm Jose Sarnetsky, and I, together with my co-chair, Professor Lawrence Sherman, are chairing the International Jury for Stockholm Prize in Criminology. And now, with one year delay, we are going to listen to our prize winner. Prize winners. I'm going to start to introduce to you in the few words, Professor Philip Jackson Cook, and then we will listen to the Professor Cook's lecture. After that, Professor Sherman will introduce Franklin Zimring, and we will listen to Professor Zimring lecture. Professor Philip Jackson Cook has his D PhD from University of California in Berkeley when he, then he got his PhD in 1973. He is the Terry Sanford Professor of Public Policy in at the Stanford, uh, Stanford School of Public Policy, Duke University. And he's also holding the position at the Sociology in Economics. I have to add that Professor Cook is, uh, has his PhD is in Economy. Uh, the latest book uh, Cook published is a book about what, what everyone needs to know about the public. Uh, to, to, with, <laughs> once more, I'm sorry. Uh, what everyone needs to know about the, uh, the uh, know about the, the, the shooting, the gun shooting. And uh, this book is published in 2014. And this is for his enormously important work in the work in the shootings, gun violence. So we are awarding Professor Cook with this prize. Uh, Professor Cook is also uh, being uh, participating in many different other um, efforts related to, to, to gun violence, other kinds of violence, and was supporting uh, American government, American, uh, American National Council, um, Research Council, and National Academy of Sciences with his knowledge about this very important problem. As you know, we have we are having in Sweden at the moment very serious problems with problems with gun, gun violence. Therefore, we are welcoming Professor Cook to learn us most more about this extremely important subject. Thank you, Professor Sherman. Thank you, Professor Sarnecki. Thinking about gun violence is something I've been doing off and on for the last 45 years. It's a great honor to have my research in this area recognized by the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, and especially to share that prize with the originator of the field, Franklin Zimring. It is indeed a young field. Professor Zimmering published the very first article in 1968. Of course, these days it is a flourishing field with hundreds of articles published each year in law, criminology, medicine, public policy, and economics. The research agenda in this field, as in many other fields in criminology, is shaped by the policy debate. But scientific standards still apply, uh, starting with objectivity. Most of the research in the area uses data from the United States. Uh, and that has been true for my research as well. In US law and culture, guns are a legitimate commodity and, of course, quite popular quarter of all adults have at least one gun, and in fact they average five, with some people having dozens or scores of guns in their home. For them, and for many of us, in fact, guns provide recreation, uh, hunting, target shooting, collecting, and also provide a peace of mind. Uh, because they are thought to, to provide uh, defense against intruders and uh, possible attackers. 
Self-defense is indeed an increasingly important motive for acquiring and carrying guns. But guns are widely misused. There are 40,000 deaths in 2019, about the same number as died on the highways. 75% of all homicides were committed with the gun, 50% of all suicides. So putting this together, the goal of policy in the United States is to reduce misuse uh, while preserving, preserving the consumer value. Many people would say that uh, this is a high wire act and are skeptical of our ability to do both. Uh, and yet, I think that one effect of my research looking back has to been to suggest uh, that to some extent it is possible. Today's agenda has three parts to it, instrumentality and social cost, then availability, and third, policing and accountability. So let's get started. This actually was the very first topic that uh, Franklin Zimmering studied uh, and also the very first topic that I studied when I uh, jumped on board in um, 1976, a, a few years later. Uh, the, the very basic idea here is that the type of weapon matters in crime and that in particular the likelihood of death in a criminal attack depends on the power of the weapon, not just on the intent of the attacker. Uh, so you, uh, of course, make a sharp distinction. We all make a sharp distinction in the law between whether the victim dies, in which case it's a criminal homicide, or lives, in which case it's a criminal assault. Um, but that difference is not just um, about the criminal intent of the attacker, but also about the type of weapon that they happen to have. Uh, Zimring demonstrated that the weapon had an independent causal effect on the outcome uh, in two articles he wrote in 1968 and 1972. And this finding has been replicated and extended by me and others uh, over the years. I consider it to be established fact, although it does remain controversial in the policy debate. Uh, Guns, quite simply, provide assailants with the means of killing at a distance. They don't require any particular skill or strength or even sustained determination uh, that a victim can be killed way easier with a gun than, say, with a knife. Uh, and usually when something is easier, it happens more often, and, and that sadly is the case when it comes to criminal attacks with guns. That's not the only uh, way in which the particular characteristics of a gun uh, matter for the uh, shape of criminal activity. They also increase the scope of criminal attacks uh, and the extent of the damage that they're done. And, and so I just reference here drive-by shootings, uh, they can constitute as much as half of all of the homicides in big cities in the U.S. And, and, and of course, there just are no drive-by knifings. Uh, more prominently, mass shootings in schools and other public places uh, are, by definition, done with a gun, but there is no substitute. Uh, and increasingly in the U.S., those mass shootings are being done not just with handguns, but with assault weapons that are designed for killing a lot of people quickly. Uh, I would also look to political assassination. All, all of the presidents who have been assassinated in the U.S. were assassinated with guns. Uh, and then uh, something uh, much more ordinary, which is just stray bullets and, and the ability uh, in a neighborhood where there is a lot of gunplay for the residents to be terrified or, or terrorized by uh, bullets and the possibility that 
they will inadvertently become a victim or their children will be. Uh, okay. So, if we can try to understand the impact then of widespread gun availability, uh, we can turn to two different metrics. And um, I, th I think it's important to get this right and to be clear about it, just how we're trying to measure the problem. Uh, one, and, and this is by far the most common, is to count the lives of actual victims. And, and so we do say the gun problem is uh, 40,000 people uh, were killed last year in 2019 uh, by gun. We might add to that that another 70,000 um, people were shot in criminal circumstances and survived, but survived with a gunshot injury. Uh, so it's a count of actual victims, which sometimes it is also translated um, into a monetary value. Uh, and the problem with that approach is that it's incomplete uh, and I think misleading as a guide to prevention priorities. Uh, it, it's certainly useful and I, I use it myself, but uh, if you think about it, you realize that it just doesn't seem right in terms of some of the conclusions you might draw if you focused only on the number of deaths and injuries. Take, for example, the relative importance of mass shootings, in particular shootings in, in schools. I mean, they are seen, and, and there is a general consensus that this is a great problem, uh, and yet they only account for uh, far less than 1% of all of the gun deaths each year in the United States. Uh, so if, if you're just looking at the number of bodies, you end up thinking that this is a relatively trivial problem. Uh, if you uh, th think about it more broadly, however, and realized that this um, invasion of uh, what is supposed to be a safe place for children, a, a public school, uh, and the, the threat to the lives of entirely innocent victims, is something that looms very large in the public imagination and takes a tangible response uh, where millions of school children each year are drilled within their school about what to do it, if there is a, uh, a gunman who comes in and starts shooting. Uh, and so, in effect, we're having the effect of terrorizing millions of children every year uh, because this problem is seen as so important, and it has in it has to be seen that way. Uh, uh, in terms of assassination, the number of political assassinations it has been zero uh, since 1981 was the last time a president was shot, for example. Um, and yet, billions of dollars are spent each year to protect the presidents and other politicians, and so. So this idea that we can learn something by um, counting victims, I, I think it's accurate, but it is uh, as far as it goes, but that ultimately it's incomplete, it's misleading. Uh, that a more broader approach to value the threat of victimization, which affects everyone, uh, is uh, more appropriate, especially for making policy judgments about how to proceed. The value of reducing uh, gun violence was something that I studied with Jens Ludwig. Uh, we wrote a book in 2000, uh, and the focus was on the value of personal safety and the safety of others in, in reducing fear and, and trauma, the value of the precautions that were being taken, and then more generally the improvement in the neighborhood and material standard of living that could be accomplished by reducing the gun violence uh, rate. The method we used for placing a monetary value on that, it was developed by economists. It's called contingent valuation. Uh, and it really uh, asks uh, a, a representative sample of the public how much they would be willing to pay for a reduction in the likelihood of 
um, they would be shot and the people they cared about would be shot. So we were able to implement that uh, and develop this broad estimate. Uh, certainly we found that all kinds of people are willing to pay for greater safety from gun violence and to pay a substantial amount. Alternative approach is uh, at least in principle, to look at the effect uh, on property values of the threat of gun violence. And in neighborhoods, of course, with, with high rates uh, of violence, that people are, are moving out, there is very little investment, and so that we have the phenomenon of reduced property values, which in a sense provides a market measure of the value of reducing gun violence or of increasing gun violence. Um, okay, so the conclusions from this part one discussion of instrumentality uh, and the social cost of gun violence, um, that instrumentality, inst instrumentality uh, says that gun use intensifies violence, uh, that it makes um, the typical criminal assault more likely to kill, and it expands the, the scope and the range of criminal violence. Uh, for the social costs, generally, we have to take into account not only the uh, loss of life, but also the fear and the trauma at the community level, the disinvestment and, and the property values. Uh, so we end up saying that gun violence affects not only the quantity of life, but also the quality. And while subjective, that has very tangible implications. Okay, let me turn to part two. Uh, we have, this part two is about gun availability in the U.S. Um, and most adults have the right to uh, possess a gun in the U.S. and so that, in a sense, the guns are widely available. About 35% of the household, and as I said, 25% of the individuals have one or more guns. Um, but for active criminals, most of them are banned by federal law and by state law due to their, their criminal record. So the basic approach to preventing uh, gun violence in the United States is to try to create a barrier to a, a relatively small group from obtaining guns while letting everyone else have as many as they want to. It's a sort of high wire act. Uh, the question is, is it possible? Um, you can uh, take both a supply and a demand approach, and, and in the U.S. that has happened, so that on the demand, people who are not qualified to own a gun because of their criminal record can be arrested and prosecuted if they're caught with one. Uh, let me look at the supply side and particularly the sources of guns used in crime. Uh, what we know is that active criminals and guns used in crime actually have different immediate sources than those that are possessed by uh, ordinary people. Most people, 60% buy their guns from a retailer, but, but criminals is just 10%, something we know from surveys. The gun transactions that arm criminals uh, include that they're diverted from legal possession through sale or loan or gift or sometimes theft. Uh, and that notice that much of this action is personal. And in fact, the availability in practice for somebody who's not qualified to buy a gun at a store uh, is through personal connections. So I think the uh, logical implication of this is that the local prevalence matters uh, and led to a hypothesis uh, that I had uh, starting in 1979 that the percent of households with a gun, the prevalence, affects availability to criminals. Uh, that makes sense uh, as an implication of the idea that criminals are obtaining their gun from personal connections. If they live in a community where a lot of people have guns, then it's more likely that their personal connections will have guns and that they can use that and take advantage of that. 
Uh, to test this hypothesis, I wanted to look at variation across places and over time. Uh, and what was required to do that successfully was to have a measure of prevalence. So that is the percentage of households with a gun. But of course, in the US, there's no registration data. Surveys are, can be used, in, uh, but they have to be used very carefully. They're not very accurate. Uh, and that I thought uh, a first step in this empirical inquiry was to develop a good proxy. Um, I, my first attempt was published uh, back in 79, and then in 2001, working with Deb Azrael and Matt Miller, we came up with uh, a different and improved proxy. That is the percent of all suicides with a gun, uh, fondly known as FSS. And we validated that by comparing it with survey data of household gun ownership across jurisdictions, across states, over time, uh, even across countries. It seems to be a, a very faithful indicator of the likelihood that any particular household will have a gun uh, along the way. So notice it, it is the, not the suicide rate. It is the percent of suicides, however many there are that are committed with the gun. Uh, and what uh, has been found using this index is a number of things. A lot of people have put it to work, and it, and it is the uh, go-to uh, index these days for this kind of empirical work. I worked again with Jens Ludwig on a study of the effect of um, FSS on homicide. Uh, we use the data for the largest 100 counties in the U.S. over a 20-year period and ran panel regressions. What we found was that it can be interpreted this way, that a 10% increase in, the, in prevalence, such as an increase from 0.3 to 0.33, uh, results in an increase in overall homicide, an increase uh, uh, still larger proportionally in gun homicide, but no change in non-gun homicide. Uh, and what that suggests is that there is a negative externality of gun ownership. So the law-abiding citizens, households with guns, uh, actually are creating a hazard by making guns more available to criminals, uh, and that the elasticity, uh, to use the economic term, uh, it, that we estimated then relates to the external cost per additional gun-owning households. It differs among jurisdictions depending on how much violence there is in those jurisdictions, uh, but on average it is well over $100 per year. So that anybody who acquires a gun and adds that to their household is then creating uh, some uh, expected level of damage to the community. Okay. I've also been involved in qualitative research on gun trans transactions, uh, surveys of arrestees and inmates uh, that I've done in Cook County uh, in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, and what we found by talking to the offenders who had used guns in their crimes uh, was that the transactions costs differ widely among uh, offenders. Some of them said it was easy to get a gun, others said it took them weeks. Uh, that high costs uh, block some of the transactions and, and so that there are a number of uh, criminals who would like to have a gun but don't because they don't know how to get one or it's too hard or too expensive. Uh, if they belong to a gang, it helps, um, and gangs often facilitate gun access. Uh, and finally, that criminals are sensitive to the legal risk of gun transactions the police can help disrupt the market. All right. So, what we um, then, or what I then went on to was, and, and this is my uh, most recent uh, research program, is to study the role of the police and making shooters accountable in preventing gun violence. So let me talk um, about recent findings in, in that connection. The 
First thing is a very basic, public safety is a government responsibility and, and police are charged with investigating criminal shootings, arresting suspects and preparing cases for trial. Uh, and what is not so widely recognized is that the primary goal for all these activities is the prevention of subsequent violence. Uh, it, of course, happens after the event, uh, after the shooting takes place, but the purpose of it, the rationale for it, is primarily to prevent future such events, uh, something recognized by the, the founder of modern policing, Sir Robert Peel, uh, what we have is at least three mechanisms, deterrence, incapacitation, and, and then the possibility of interrupting the retaliatory uh, cycle. So in all those ways, uh, success in arresting and punishing shooters will reduce the amount of shooting through these prevention mechanisms. Okay, so what, it, what is uh, distressing and looking at the large cities in the U.S. is that many of them have a very low rate of arrest and conviction for shootings. Uh, so that this potential protective effect or prevention effect is not being taken advantage of. Uh, the controversy in criminology in part has been whether additional effort on the part of police departments and particularly detectives could make a difference and increase the arrest rate. Uh, ordinarily, extra effort is going to pay off, uh, but for whatever reason, the, um, the uh, criminologists uh, working especially at the Rand Corporation in the 1970s concluded that crimes either solve themselves or they never get solved, and, and that the investigation really matters. Uh, what I decided was uh, a good test of, of this odd proposition was a natural experiment comparing fatal and non-fatal shootings uh, because they are almost identical in terms of circumstances and in terms of the people who are involved. Whether the victim lives or dies turns out to be primarily a matter of luck if there's a shooting. 20% uh, die, 80% live. Uh, and the difference is that the fatal cases in practice get much more attention from the police on average and have a much higher arrest rate uh, as a result. So that, that's the question. Uh, can we learn something by looking at this comparison? Uh, working with Anthony Braga, we collected data on shootings in Boston so over five years, and we found that shooting cases um, do differ widely in terms of their solvability, uh, but the fatal and non-fatal cases have very similar distributions of solvability, and, and in both, the easy cases are solved quickly. So within two days, we found an arrest rate of 11% for both, uh, fatal and non-fatal. The extra effort by detectives for the fatal cases began to pay off for cases that required a long-term investigation uh, and that were more difficult, less solvable. We saw that the uh, arrest rate continued to climb for the homicides, but that it flattened out very quickly for the non-fatal shoot shootings where the detectives have a, an extremely high caseload. So the obvious conclusion was that arrest rates for those non-fatal shootings could be increased with more sustained effort and, and that uh, that is uh, an available tactic for police departments that want to allocate their resources. It would have the effect of deterring and incapacitating more shooters. Lessons from all this. First of all, uh, looking at the all, all three parts in at my career, uh, of course, I would like to think there are a number of lessons, but three I will highlight. First, that gun violence has far-reaching effects on the quality of life as well as the quantity. It is something worth being concerned about and attending to. The second lesson is, uh, perhaps surprisingly, that regulation and, and enforcement efforts are making a difference even in the United States that has fairly lax uh, rules uh, and that if we would put more effort into it, uh, 
that it would make still more difference, and especially enforcement on the underground market. Uh, so that leads to the feasible priorities for uh, enforcement and the use of police in this area. The first, I would say, is to disrupt the underground market, to increase the legal risk uh, to people who trade in that market and make guns less available. And the second is to devote more investigation resources to shootings, particularly to non-fatal shootings, so that we can take better advantage of the preventive effects of, of arrest uh, and conviction. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cook, for that outstanding review of your extremely influential work uh, and the major advancement uh, in knowledge about gun violence that you have contributed through your career. I'll have more to say about it at the prize ceremony that follows these lectures, uh, and I hope some of our audience right now uh, will be able to stay on to see uh, uh, Queen Sylvia present the uh, Stockholm Prize in Criminology Award to our two winners. But right now, it's, it's my duty as uh, uh, the co-chair of the jury uh, that selected both of our winners to introduce the second winner and to bring to your attention the um, work of Franklin Zimring, uh, who, like Professor Cook, is an amazing uh, Renaissance style scholar uh, covering a very broad waterfront uh, about so many issues. Um, you don't even know, for example, about Professor Cook's uh, uh, work on um, the distribution of rewards in society as uh, straight up economics uh, and the winner take all societies uh, analysis that um, uh, relates to income inequality and some of the long term consequences not the least of which is gun violence, which tends to be higher in places with greater inequality. Um, and to have the breadth of scholarship that Franklin Zimring has brought to um, all crime problems and indeed other legal issues, but primarily uh, thinking about crime as uh, a scholar trained in law, uh, but with very substantial social science influence uh, brings him to uh, the position of luck in his life, I would say, in having uh, the great Australian uh, criminal criminologist, uh, Norval Morris, later dean of the University of Chicago Law School, where uh, Franklin Zimmering uh, studied and then uh, immediately became a professor upon graduation and went right to work for the National Commission on Causes and Prevention of Violence, where he did his uh, basic uh, and, and fundamental work on instrumentality effects. So, uh, not just guns more than knives, but bigger guns um, more than smaller guns and uh, addressing uh, a preposterous argument that um, uh, there would not be any difference if um, certain kinds of guns would be banned because people would find uh, other, other weapons. Um, this is one of the, the many tough questions that he's taken on with incisive logic, uh, starting with the overall uh, conception of deterrence. And this is his first book in 1971. The University of Chicago uh, Press providing uh, a substantial theoretical uh, basis for a lot of what uh, we know and uh, have since learned with uh, extra um, uh, research guided uh, in the past uh, half century by Professor Zimmering's uh, work. Um, he, he continued into many fields such as the death penalty and its deterrent effects, uh, mandatory uh, imprisonment on the third uh, offense uh, uh, in California, the three strikes law uh, in his book, Punishment and Democracy. Um, more recently, his book about how uh, the city that became safe, the uh, New York City uh, police story of trying to get a hold of gun violence and in fact, reducing homicide rates by 80% um, was told um, better and with more rigorous comparative scholarship uh, in that book than in any other. His, his book, um, crime is not the problem, comparing homicide rates versus other crime rates across different countries, showing that uh, in England, for example, where I live, we're much more violent, but much less lethal uh, than uh, the place in which I was born, the United States. Um, and, and yet, when we look at lethality of, of police and the question of when police kill, under what basis, and how often that affects the police themselves, we see enormous differences in his scholarship 
showing the police are 50 times uh, more likely to be killed in the US than they are in Germany or the United Kingdom. This, this range of scholarship will soon be clear to you as soon as I stop talking, let him give his Stockholm Prize lecture. So please join with me in welcoming uh, this outstanding winner of the Stockholm Prize in Criminology uh, for 2020, uh, Professor Franklin E. Zimmering of the University of California at Berkeley Old Hall Law School. Welcome, Professor Zimmering, the floor is yours. Thank you for that kind introduction. Firearms ownership and use have been important parts of American life for centuries. But the involvement of social scientists in the study of firearms and violence is a much more recent phenomenon. The President's Crime Commission was appointed in the mid-1960s and produced a comprehensive series of reports in 1967, but there was no research-specific focus on guns and violence there, continuing a tradition in that respect that was also characteristic of the Wickersham Commission in 1931. But the 1967 Commission report was overtaken by two major political assassinations during the first six months of 1968 and by public concern about increasing levels of life-threatening violence. So a federal Congress that had passed no major gun regulations since 1938 then passed two major gun control laws in 1968. And President Johnson appointed a new national commission on the causes and prevention of violence shortly after Robert Kennedy was shot and killed in Los Angeles. The ink wasn't dry on the President's Crime Commission 1967 report, but there was an urgent need to investigate the causes and prevention of life-threatening violence in particular. A task force on firearms and its link to life-threatening violence was a high priority for the new commission, but there was very little published empirical research to read and no scholars with extensive research on the topic. So in short order, a new federal task force needed to organize the important topics to be investigated, to obtain and analyze data on a wide variety of important issues, and to produce a comprehensive analysis of all of this in less than a year. This adventure was my first experience with government in public policy emergencies and the task force report was my first book length publication. In this lecture, I will discuss what was known and supposed about one key issue in that task force report and to contrast the state of our knowledge in 1969 with what is known and presumed a half century later. My talk is based on a longer paper that also covers instrumentality effects. But the key issue for today is to discuss the relationship between firearms ownership and the rate of gun use in violence. The central question as it was posed in 1969 was more firearms more firearms violence. A half century after the 1969 report, this question is still of central importance to social science and to the analysis of public policy toward firearms. But what have we learned a half century later and how should that new knowledge influence research and policy? on the relationship between general rates of gun possession and the use of guns in violent crime, 
The 1969 report's conclusion was confident and unqualified. To quote, data from three sources document that the proportion of gun use and violence rises and falls with gun ownership. Statistics from Detroit show that firearms violence increased after an increase in handgun acquisitions. Regional comparisons show that the percentage of gun use and violent attacks parallels rates of gun ownership. A study of guns used in homicides, robberies, and assaults in eight major cities shows that cities with a high proportion of gun use in one crime tend to have high proportions of gun use in the other crimes that are reported. There are, in retrospect, however, at least two ambiguities in the evidence that was produced in this critical chapter. The concept of gun ownership, which is to be linked to variations in gun use and violence, and the type of gun that is importantly linked to use in violent crime. The task force estimated that only 24% of all guns in circulation in 1968 were handguns. But that 24% were responsible for 76% of all gun killings in 1967. So the involvement of handguns was nine times as likely per 100 weapons owned as the involvement of long guns. In the 10 cities where the task force obtained type of gun for firearms aggravated assaults and robberies, handguns were 86% of all the guns used in assault and 96% of all the guns used in firearms robberies. With these overwhelming concentrations, it seems likely that more firearms, more firearms violence in chapter 11 is referring particularly to handguns. And two of the three time studies that were reported, Detroit and the 10 city studies, were handgun dominated. Only the cross-section comparison of regions was measuring all types of guns with equal weight in the report. Yet the text of this chapter didn't specify whether total guns or handguns were the critical independent variable. The second ambiguity in chapter 11 is less visible, and that is the issue of how gun ownership is best measured when predicting the impact of ownership variations on the involvement of guns in violence. Is it a change in the total number of guns in civilian hands? or a change in the proportional households that obtain or own at least one weapon. There was a third serious limit to the temporal data from which the task force predicted more firearms, more firearms violence. The critical time for observing trends over time in chapter 11 was very short. 1965 to 1969, and unrepresentative of other periods. There was, in fact, a large increase in firearms purchases, and more particularly in handgun introduction to the civilian market during this period. But the same extraordinary events that provoked such an explosive increase in gun purchase might have also provoked exceptional levels of violence. If ever a time series cried out 
for a longer and less exceptional period than 1965 through 1968, it was the material on Detroit in Chapter 11 of Firearms and Violence. The decades after 1969 have never neglected the discussion of firearms and violence for any sustained period. Gun use and violence increased until 1974, fell back, and then revisited that 1974 peak in 1980. Crime and violence both declined through 1985 and then increased again through 1993 before dropped substantially in the 1990s and staying quite low for the first two decades of the new century. While patterns of crime fluctuated, the interest in firearms and violence was always a much more important part of policy discussion related to crime, and the involvement of social scientists and government statisticians and regulators increased consistently through the ups and downs fluctuations of crime and violence. The number of scholars and number of studies concerned with guns and violence has steadily grown. My aim here is to discuss what this thicker collection of studies and analysts have taught us about the conclusions reached in the 1969 report. With more time and analysis, have the basic conclusions on gun ownership impacts on violence survived, sustained, scrutiny. A cursory survey of data and analysis in recent years suggests a sharp contrast between the impact of new knowledge on instrumentality effects and the impact of this new knowledge on data on the current understanding of how changes in gun ownership influence rates of gun violence. The instrumentality effects remain as close to consensus as any important question in the hotly contested policy debates about firearms and violence. By contrast, there is much less consensus about whether increased levels of gun ownership are closely linked to increased gun violence. In a long period of high levels of gun sales, but stable levels of gun violence, seems to provide support for skepticism about the more guns, more gun violence mantra. A closer analysis of the evidence on this question, however, does not prove the negative of this theorem. The task force report was confident that there was a direct linkage between changes in gun ownership and changes of gun use in violence. The unqualified, almost mechanical relationship was the title to a chapter, more firearms, more firearms violence. The implications of this analysis were not accepted by many gun-owning groups because it suggested that variations in the rate of legitimate gun ownership could be an influence on rates of prohibited gun violence. The ideology of the groups like the NRA imagines a wall between legitimate gun owners and ownership and guns and criminal actors and uses of guns. So this was a contested theory from day one. One natural use of a half century of subsequent American history is to trace the impact of general gun ownership 
on the involvement of firearms and violence. What are the lessons of this subsequent history? Well, there are two methods available to measure trends in civilian gun ownership, production, and import statistics, and survey research, which asks a representative sample of the population whether they own guns. As we shall see, these contrasting techniques also paint different pictures of trends in gun ownership. Production and import statistics provides very accurate data on how many new guns and what kinds of guns are introduced to the civilian market each year. Because there's no account of how many guns go out of use or circulation, the volume of new guns provides an indirect and approximate measure of the extent to which the total stocks of guns have changed in a year or in a decade. And what production and import statistics over the last generation suggest is a substantial rate of expansion in handguns, the highest risk weapon for violence, 1986 was a not atypical year in the 1980s for the introduction of new handguns in the US. Here I compare federal data on handgun production and imports in 1986 with parallel data for 2015, a year that was also not atypical for its era in gun introduction. The U.S. population expanded by a third between 1986 and 2015, and the number of handguns introduced in one year expanded by over 300%. While the base number of firearms owned in either year isn't available to provide a precise measure of how much of a proportional increase these one-year additions represented, a fourfold increase in gun additions is certain to represent a significant increase in gun ownership, and these single years were each typical of their period, so that the more recent half decade probably increased the number of handguns in circulation by at least 25 million. Wouldn't more firearms, more violence predict that rates of handgun violence would be expanding significantly over this period? Yet from 2006 to 2015, the FBI's estimate of murder rates fell from 5.8 per 100,000 to 4.9 per 100,000. And both these rates are at the lower end of U.S. homicide levels for the late 20th and early 21st century. Doesn't this disprove the more guns, more gun violence thesis of the National Violence Commission? Probably not. But unraveling the recent story of gun acquisition in the United States and its implication for using and predicting gun use and violence is a modestly complicated journey. The 1969 task force report used two different measures of firearms inventory to arrive at an estimate of total guns in circulation, production and import statistics, and the level of gun ownership reported in a one-time national survey that was supported by the Violence Commission. The hard data estimates from the task force of 100 million guns produced 
and the survey estimate was about 80 million firearms. So the task force split the difference and provided an ownership estimate in 1968 of 90 million, 35 million rifles, 31 million shotguns, and 24 million handguns. The estimated number of handguns to be added in 1968 was 2.4 million, which is a full 10% of the then estimated national inventory. The National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago has been asking about gun ownership in the general social survey since the 1970s and published a report Trends in Gun Ownership in the United States, 1972 to 2014. But the NORC survey shows a long-term decline in gun ownership and stability rather than increase in handgun ownership by American households during the very high handgun introduction period after 2005. How is such a discrepancy possible between huge increases in the number of handguns introduced in the US and the percentage of persons reporting that they own guns? There may in fact be no contradiction between an expanding population of guns but consistency or decline in personal household gun ownership because the volume of firearms introduced in the United States reports what public health practitioners would call the incidence of guns in the U.S., while household surveys report what is called the prevalence of gun ownership in households. The incidence of firearms in the American population is the total number of guns that are owned by the civilian population. With such a substantial increase in gun production and imports, the incidence of guns has also certainly been increasing in recent years. But the incidence of guns doesn't measure what proportion of the population owns the masses of guns in the, in the country. The prevalence of gun ownership measures what proportion of households own guns, and polls like the NORC Social Survey measure this prevalence of guns ownership what proportion of the population owns guns. Since these two concepts measure different characteristics, there's no logical inconsistency in one reporting an increase while the other reports a decrease for the same period. But how might increases of gun introduction of the magnitude that we've been seeing in recent years not be reflected as well in an increase of the proportion of Americans who own guns. The only way that millions of additional handguns could be absorbed in a population where the proportion of households that own guns was stable or declining would be if lots of the new guns introduced in the civilian market were being purchased by persons who already own guns. Multiple gun ownership is a major element in the U.S. population to the extent that a small fraction of households could acquire a very large proportion of new guns. A report in The Guardian in 2016 asserted that 3% of the U.S. population own 50% of the guns.
if these hardcore super owners are the major market for new handguns, the incidence of guns and the prevalence of gun ownership could exhibit different trends. But the task force on firearms didn't mention the relevant measure as between incidence and prevalence when asserting the importance of more firearms, more firearms violence. Which of these two concepts should be employed when rendering a judgment about whether Chapter 11's thesis has proved out in the years since 1969? Changes in the incidence of handguns would have some effect on the volume of guns at risk for theft or secondary transfer, but would not directly influence the proportions of citizens with personal access to guns when contemplating gun use in suicide attempts or violent acts. It is the presence or absence of a gun in the household of residents that makes a gun available for violence. So it is the first gun in this setting, rather than the number of guns in the house, that should have the most direct impact on whether a gun is used in violence. So it is reasonable to assume that the authors of Firearms and Violence in American Life would have chosen prevalence as the key concept for their theory of more firearms, more firearms violence. If so, did this prevalence hypothesis prove them wrong in the last half century. The general decline over time in household prevalence is consistent with homicide trends, as is the sharp drop in prevalence in the late 1990s and the flat pattern after 2006. There is thus some reason to appreciate the quality of the task force's instinct in its initial efforts to comprehend a complicated and important problem. The methods and evidence of instrumentality effects in 1969 provided an effective foundation for future studies and for estimates of instrumentality effects that were close to in both direction and magnitude to current estimates. But the conceptual foundation for studies of the effects of gun ownership on firearms use and violence were not sufficient to produce clear and convincing statistical accounts. It is only when incidence and prevalence of gun ownership are distinguished that survey data can provide a coherent explanation of the link between firearms availability and the use of guns in violence. But the major contrast now, just as in 1969 in this field, is still between knowledge and policy. We know better than we do on firearms and violence in 2021, and this is much more a deficiency of public will than of scientific knowledge. Thank you very much, Professor Zimring. Thank you very much, Professor Cook for sharing with us this extremely important knowledge about gun violence. Our problem here, problems here in Sweden are not exactly the same kind as what we are getting to, under, to, we are got to understand from these lectures. It's that problems are extremely complicated and the policymaker needs to take these problems to their knowledge.
Dear friends, I would very much like to invite you for a beautiful dinner at the Golden Hall in the City Hall in Stockholm. Unfortunately, not this year. I'm, very, I ho I'm hoping very much I will see all of you next year at such a dinner. Now I would like to invite you to prize ceremony, which is starting in 10 minutes at the same channel, but it's also possible to see this at the home pages of the Swedish uh, Council for Crime Prevention and also at the uh, Stockholm Prize in Criminology. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next year.